In this lecture, we're going to be continuing our discussion about the 10 steps that the author outlines in the chapter two of Think Like an Architect. And we've gone through kind of the first six items, and all of these are looking at different aspects of architecture and sort of establishing guiding principles that you could apply to any building that you look at, either one that you're visiting in person and experiencing yourself, or one that you're looking at, whether it's modern or historic, um, you could be looking at it, you know, in photographs or, you know, something else, but you can apply these principles and some architecture exemplifies more of these than others, but you can take these 10 steps and kind of apply them. So let's take a look at number seven. And this one talks about taking historical precedents and, and looking at them through the lens of whatever building you happen to be examining. So when we talk about precedents, it really means whatever guiding principles were established prior to the design or building of that particular structure. So, you know, here we're looking at this castle and this is not the first castle ever constructed. So when you look at this building, you start to think, well, okay, so where, where did the idea of this come from and where did the design and detailing and construction and all of these kind of things happen and and most of the time architecture is occurring on a timeline and is often drawing from different buildings from its past and that could be the more recent past or the ancient past depending on what the timeline is. Now, not only are there historical precedents for this particular building, but clearly this serves as a precedent for more recent buildings. So if there's any reference to, you know, castle construction or turrets or uh, gothic windows or, you know, anything that resembles something like this, this may potentially be serving as a historical precedent for a more recent building. So one of the buildings that we're going to look at, and it's actually a series of buildings, is the Isa Grand Shrine in Japan. And this is in Isa City. And this is actually a complex of buildings. So when we talk about the shrine, it really is, you know, a, kind of broken down into two main shrines. They refer to it as the inner shrine and the outer shrine. And the shrine itself is a Shinto shrine and is a sacred place that was established over 2,000 years ago. And the story of the establishment of the shrine says that the emperor's daughter was searching for a place to establish a shrine dedicated to the Shinto goddess Amaterasu, the sun goddess. And she was kind of wandering through different areas of Japan and found this uh, wooded area that where people could commune with nature and where she could establish the shrine. So the shrine is actually uh, consisting of the two parts, the inner and outer. So the inner is referred to as the Naiku and the outer shrine is referred to as the Geku. And so both of these are essentially walled off to the public. In this photograph you see this wooden fence. It's kind of a tall wooden fence. And this is not meant to be visited by the general public. So if you go to this area you can see the tops of the shrine buildings and these kind of thatched roof temples but only from behind this wooden fence. So some of the shrine buildings are 
kind of encased in these series of wooden fences, not just a single fence. And we'll see in the next photograph that um, there's kind of these series of wooden fences. Um, but this covers a really quite a large area because uh, the inner and outer shrine are actually, you know, several kilometers away from each other. And the complex as a whole, when it talks about the grand shrine, um, there are over a hundred buildings or something like 123 or 125 buildings um, and not just buildings we're talking about structures so that some of them are large some of them are, are small um, so one of the interesting things about the shrine is you know when we're looking at this you can see here that there are multiple fences and kind of there are varying heights and variant varying levels. Um, it was meant to be uh, part of the imperial family's uh, worship space, and so the current kind of caretaking of the shrine is intended to be by a descendant of the Japanese imperial family. Um, now, one of the one of the kind of key reasons for establishing the shrine and the lore kind of follows that it was the emperor's daughter and one of the sacred objects in Shinto culture is this idea of the sacred mirror and the sacred mirror would um, assist in worshiping uh, the sun goddess for whom the the shrine is dedicated and so uh, the sacred mirror is supposed to be encased or enshrined in, in a building. Now the buildings that you see here, the architecture of these buildings was established several hundred years before uh, the establishment of the shrine. So it was from the Kofun period in uh, Japan and it's characterized by extreme simplicity and you know there are thatched roofs uh, the structure is expressed on the outside and inside of the building. These are typically wooden structures. Um, nature is extremely sacred in uh, this culture, and so the use of wood and natural materials uh, expresses um, kind of humility, and um, it's in reference to the Shinto goddess. Now, um, one of the other interesting things about this is this idea of um, permanence and replacement and uh, perfection. So earlier we were talking about the Parthenon and the Parthenon really expressed Greek ideals of order and mathematics and perfection and some of what we look at here is kind of the opposite of that. Um, so here you can see um, an example of the thatched roof on the right and uh, on the left it's one of the uh, kind of pathways or entrances connecting different portions of the uh, shrine complex. So let's look at kind of this example of uh, the guiding principles of the aesthetics of this complex. So one thing that comes up often in Japanese aesthetics, when we talk about aesthetics it could be architecture or art or um, craftsmanship is this idea of wabi-sabi. And wabi-sabi states that nothing is perfect and again this is almost the complete opposite of what we see in classical Western architecture where um, this idea of order and perfection flows throughout you know Greek antiquity and Roman antiquity and you know even into modern buildings where uh, it's the ideal is to be extremely ordered. When we talk about the ideals being imperfect, this idea of wabi-sabi, you know, how does that play out into the architecture? So um, there are kind of three main things. Nothing is perfect, nothing is complete, and nothing is permanent. 
And again, these are kind of the opposite uh, structures or ideals that um, many classical architectural forms take on. So how this plays out in the shrine complex is that since nothing is complete, the shrine is intended to be uh, continually worked on and continually rebuilt. So the, sh the shrine itself is actually rebuilt every 20 years. So every 20 years uh, the, sh the main buildings of the shrine are dismantled and uh, rebuilt. And this is a huge expense and kind of a huge uh, logistical undertaking. But on the right here in this picture, you see uh, that they're gathering wood for the rebuilding, the next rebuilding of the temple. And well, it was the previous rebuilding. So it was rebuilt in 2013. It's scheduled to be rebuilt again in 2033. Now what you see here on the left is um, this f almost a field of white pebbles and the white pebbles um, are what the shrine is built on and you see maybe in the previous photos that the, the shrine buildings are built upon these white pebbles and there's an adjacent lot next to the current shrine and so when it's rebuilt every 20 years the entire complex or those buildings are built next to that onto the adjacent lot and then the other ones are dismantled and then that becomes the kind of empty lot but you see I don't know if you can tell off in the distance in this picture there's a single small kind of wood hut that's left and that's um, meant to be like you know the housing for the sacred mirror or you know other uh, kind of symbolic permanent, well not permanent, symbolic Shinto objects that are sacred. And so there's this one small portion of architecture that's left on that site that indicates that it's a sacred site. So nothing's permanent, so it's rebuilt every 20 years. Nothing's complete and in that cycle of rebuilding every 20 years then it's it's never complete and nothing is perfect that kind of indicates that every time it's built there's going to be something different like through the process of construction you know different um, cuts are made in different ways and uh, different materials become marked or uh, scarred in certain ways but that's that's expected. That's kind of part of these um, guiding principles where if you are looking at maybe a different cultural expectation, this idea of perfection, then if something occurs as you're building it, you might throw that piece away or, you know, replace it with something else. And so um, the expectation that nothing is perfect allows for um, a different process to take place. So you sometimes see this in Japanese um, uh, artisanship and in art where the process lends itself to a bit more exploration perhaps because um, the ideal of perfection is not there. The expectation that things will not be perfect influences it a great deal. Okay. Um, Number eight that we look at, and this is kind of the eighth step in the in the book, it says, okay, if you're looking at a building, you should analyze the compositions, proportions, and rhythm. Now, sometimes when we look at buildings, um, some are a bit, uh, I guess, easier to figure out um, than others, but all buildings have their own composition, proportion, and rhythm. It's just that they may not be necessarily symmetrical or um, you know have the same geometrical proportion or rhythm or composition. Um, now in this image obviously this is symmetrical it's kind of like balanced on uh, both the right and left side and there's a central ramp kind of unifying it but the entry door is uh, offset from the center but it still maintains a balance and um, 
composition overall. And a lot of these things are guiding principles for most designers and architects. So let's look at one example of this. And this is a building that is familiar to many people around the world. This is a Taj Mahal and is an incredibly famous and iconic piece of architecture. But it's something that we can also look at in terms of proportion, symmetry, balance, um, and you know, use of materials and other things. Um, it was established, and there, there's a lot of lore that surrounds the Taj Mahal and its creation. So um, the Shah Jahan was um, the uh, Mughal emperor in this part of India, and he had a wife named Mumtaz Mahal, and she died in 1631. So in 1631, she passed away in childbirth, and you know the legend goes that he was grief-stricken and wanted to create a tomb for her in respect and in dedication to her. And so construction began the following year in 1632 and was completed around 20 years later. And so she is buried here as is the Shah himself. And interestingly, there's inside the tomb, um, there's kind of a fake tomb, like a faux tomb, and then like their actual tomb in the, a lower level. So um, you see kind of these like symbolic uh, sarcophagi that are in inside of the structure and then the actual um, burial chamber uh, down below. So the reason why we're looking at this is because we can look at this as an example, not just kind of culturally and historically, but in terms of its uh, use of perspective, balance, symmetry, unity throughout the design. Uh, the design, and I kind of want to show this photograph so that you see both almost the elevational view of the of one of the sides, but you can see on the other side, like kind of in perspective, that it's symmetrical on all four sides. So as you're looking at it, you know, you're going to see the same kind of uh, open entrance archway and then these repeated uh, archways that are smaller that kind of stack up and serve as a, an overall base or we'd refer to that as a plinth for this large dome and then these four smaller domes all around the side. Um, the arch-shaped doorway motif that repeats throughout is, is called an iwan and this use of the iwan is, uh, is common throughout this complex and you know usually we focus on the large marble white structure in the middle but if you see on the right hand side in this photograph that these red sandstone structures um, are also spectacular but there are two so there's one on each side as you're looking um, directly at the uh, kind of front of the Taj Mahal and it faces this is on the non-river side so it faces a river and so if you're looking at it from the river you can see that the whole marble complex is flanked by these two red sandstone structures on either side. Um, and then the uh, towers, the minarets, the, these are used commonly in mosque architecture and in the Muslim world you can kind of identify a mosque by uh, a minaret. It's used for the call to prayer and it's also symbolic and is also notable um, as an expression of uh, mosque architecture. Um, so you see this, the use of the Iwan, this, um, this art shape throughout. This is an interior view looking at some of the uh, red sandstone 
structures and the materials used uh, are extremely expensive and um, remarkable in their craftsmanship. It's the story goes that there were over 20,000 workers that worked on this complex and um, that in today's dollars it would be valued at hundreds of millions of dollars in construction costs. And so you can see there's uh, carvings and they're also, not in this photograph, but there are semi-precious stones kind of inlaid throughout much of the complex. Um, and even just the detail work and the um, artisanship is, is quite phenomenal. Um, the other thing that you can see is that, you know, as we're looking at this, it, it uses the uh, kind of depth of scale and the repetition of these archways. You know, if you're looking at uh, kind of down this corridor, it gives you a sense of depth, a sense of perspective, and because these, uh, you know, same elements, these same architectural elements are repeated, it gives you a sense of human scale, even though there's not a human there, you can see that, you know, as this repeats, if this is the same size, that gives you an idea of what the the depth is and what your perspective view is and that even at the end of that that's still much larger than a human because if you're standing um, you know at this point you can obviously tell that this is much larger than you so it gives you a sense of the uh, scale of the overall building and then this idea of repetition and symmetry is carried throughout the entire complex. Um, so this is a view kind of from the river side and so you can see that these two red sandstone structures uh, are on either side of the main kind of white marble structure and this red sandstone wall, even the sandstone wall is um, quite detailed and has kind of this crenellated uh, edge and um, shape to it as you're looking at it. Um, and here you can clearly see the minarets, um, you know, two on each side of the main marble structure. And then the symmetry, not only on are all four sides symmetrical, but if you, you know, struck a line right down the middle of this, you could literally just fold it in half and have the exact same thing. So it's symmetrical on all sides if you're kind of looking on all four sides. And then even within its main, you know, kind of elevational shot, that it's symmetrical on the right and left sides. And the main marble dome is kind of anchored by this marble base that comes up and rises up and kind of meets that central uh, marble dome. And then the smaller domed areas with arches are sitting kind of to the two sides on either side. Okay, and then we take a look at um, another example. This is, uh, you know, a later example. Uh, this is an early Renaissance building called the Pazzi Chapel. And the Pazzi Chapel is extremely well known um, in architectural history, uh, mainly for its use of kind of the Renaissance principles of order, geometry, and um, you know, balance, symmetry. Now the Pazzi Chapel is actually part of a bigger complex. Um, it's the Santa Croce uh, Cathedral complex and it was built for the Pazzi family which is a highly influential and wealthy family in Florence, Italy. And this is not unlike you know perhaps the Medici family where um, they were highly influential and commissioned buildings to be built um, by notable architects of the time. And the architect of the Pazzi Chapel is Filippo Brunelleschi. And Brunelleschi is uh, noted for the Duomo in Florence. Um, he's actually buried there. And that's kind of the main building in Florence. If you go to Florence and you see this 
kind of domed structure. That's that's the Duomo. Um, now the cathedral complex, because of where the chapel is built, it was kind of wedged between buildings, and so that's a bit unusual for um, kind of an ordered Renaissance structure to have those kind of restrictions. But then when you see what he's done with the plan, that it's extremely ordered and ge geometrical, um, that he took the measurements that w were available and kind of processed them in a way where you have these uh, kind of overlaying images of the circle and the square. And so not only do you have um, this idea of kind of balance and proportion on the outside, but you see it not only in elevation, but also in plan throughout the, um, throughout the building. Now here we see the entrance to the Pazzi Chapel. And I like this photograph because you can see an actual person. And so the even though the archway and the columns are oversized compared to human, um, this idea of humanism or introducing things at the scale of humans was common in uh, Renaissance architecture. And so because it's kind of from the early Renaissance period, um, you know, making things more about individuals or uh, human people instead of on kind of an inflated um, scale that didn't make reference to people is really evidenced throughout this chapel. So if we look at a couple of other images of this, you know, inside we can see that this idea of order and proportion is carried throughout, not just on the exterior, but on the interior. So there are side chapels we can see on the left that are more, you know, scaled in proportion to humans. But also on the right, we can see that this idea of the circle within a square is really common. Uh, now we're not looking at the plan view here, but where the dome is on the right, you know, it's a circle, but it's within kind of a squared off area. So uh, these side chapels and um, the, the end of this chapel terminates with this dome existing within a square. And so these ideas of geometry, as they're repeated, whether you're conscious of them or not, you get a sense that there is some ordered rhythm in this piece of architecture that as you're progressing through it, if even if you don't know what the guiding principles are or kind of what the rules are for that particular structure, that they're there and that you can tell that uh, the architect or the designer has established these kind of rules of order and you sense that as you look up at the dome, as you see the archways, as you, you know, see all these um, pilasters. And when we're talking about the pilasters, you see what appears to be columns that are recessed into the wall. And even though those are not, uh, you know, columns that are separate from the wall, like pulled out from the wall and actually, you know, supporting something that we can see, because the pilaster is finishing out the end of that archway, it appears that that is visually supported. So these big structures, if we're looking at um, where they end up, it looks like, you know, everything's kind of right and ordered because they, those pilasters visually support everything that's happening above. And all of this is conscious. So the architect is well aware of how all of the lines and geometry of the structure comes together. So even where the pilasters are, if we look at this photograph on the right, we see that this, the archway kind of on the left in this little side chapel, um, the archway is supported by 
visually by these pilasters that are recessed into the wall. The overall archway, again, on further toward the left is again supported by a pilaster. And if you can see where those pilasters terminate at the bottom, that there are inlays on the floor that run directly out from those. So it's like um, you see this expression not only in the ceiling and the walls, it's carried throughout the floor. And then you see that where the inlay and the lines on the floor cross that you could extend those out kind of to the right where those people are standing and those would terminate into those pilasters on the end and then if you carry those up then it supports that archway and the whole thing kind of repeats. So there's or this idea of order and balance is established throughout uh, the chapel and also um, the rhythm and the mathematics of you know all of the architecture and building is combined together into one unified whole.